Uh, we're going to get our session started. Um, and that includes you, Wolfgang. Please take a seat. Um, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for National Economics. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here for an important discussion and presentation by Klaus Regling on is Europe prepared for the next crisis? Um, I will say a bit more about Klaus Regling in a moment, but just to say that Dr. Regling has his choice of any place he can speak at all times, and we're delighted that he is again chosen to speak at the Peterson Institute for International Economics when he is in such demand. This is actually a celebratory occasion in that uh, this is the fifth anniversary, or fifth birthday roughly, of the European Stability Mechanism being founded, of which uh, Klaus Regling is the founding uh, managing director. Um, Klaus has, of course, been at the center of European economic policy going back quite a long ways now. Um, I got to know, and many of my colleagues, of course, got to work with Klaus in his one of his previous roles where he was head of DG, Director General of Economics and Finance for the European Commission. Um, I didn't say anything wrong, did I? No, okay, good. Um, and of course, he played a critical role in the creation of the Stability and Growth Pact and many of the so-called master criteria in a previous generation of work. And he has played a critical role throughout the European economic and financial crisis. Um, he's also, of course, CEO of the European Financial Stability Facility, a position that he also held since the creation of said facility in June 2010. He has had some private sector experience. He's been a decade with the IMF in Washington and Jakarta. And of course, when I mentioned the things he did in the past, they were at the German Ministry of Finance as well. Um, as many of you know, Klaus uh, is a forthright speaker. Um, and we are excited to have his reflections, particularly because we know that the question he asks is you're prepared for the next crisis is the right one both for all of us who care about macroeconomic policy and European well-being, but also for his institution, the ESM. And recent remarks by European President Juncker and French President Macron give us some hint that we could build further on the European architecture in this area in coming years. We also are privileged today to have a colleague of mine and of Klaus's to add to the discussion, Dr. Gerben Zettelmeyer, who is, of course, a senior fellow here at the Peters Institute since roughly a year ago, last September. I had been courting him to come for years, and I'm glad he did. Um, he was a non-resident senior fellow here during 2013-14. For the previous two years, he was the Director General for Economic Policy of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, which of course understates his role because he was the Chief Economic Advisor to Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel as well. Previously, he had been Director of Research and Deputy Chief Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction Development. And then prior to that, like so many good folk and like Klaus, uh, did his time serving at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, this meeting is on the record. Uh, we have a very interesting statement that I got to glance through under embargo from Klaus. Um, and then we will have some remarks from Jeremy and have a freewheeling discussion. Again, thank you, Mr. Regler. Thank you very much, Adam, for your kind welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, at the Peterson Institute. I've been coming here for many years. Um, I remember even when Fred, Fred set it up um, and this building was, was um, constructed. It's a good moment. We, as you mentioned, had our fifth anniversary on Monday. Of course, it's always a bit strange if you celebrate um, the setting up of a crisis mechanism. One shouldn't celebrate too much. Um, would have been better if we had not needed it. Uh, but given that it was needed, that um, I was asked to build it up, I thought with my staff it was also appropriate to have a big cake with five candles on it and um, all that happened on, on Monday morning. But now we are here in Washington. 
Um, at the time of the IMF annual meeting, of course, it is good to look back and see what happened in Europe, um, what are the issues, what has worked well, where are we heading, and are we ready for the next crisis? Um, I think um, one always has to keep that in mind, certainly in my job, but I'm glad you mentioned it also. Um, and I think um, there are some traces of that question also in this year's IMF flagship documents, the WIO and the GFSR, um, and I think that's probably quite appropriate. I'm not predicting the next crisis here. Don't get the wrong idea, but um, I think one has to be vigilant. Um, so talking about that possibility, are we ready for that next crisis? I have seen many crises in my professional life because I'm getting so old. I have seen, um, I saw the Latin American debt crisis when I worked at the IMF in the 80s. I saw when I was in Germany in the Ministry of Finance the Tikiya crisis in 94, 95, which was the last time that we had um, tremendous intra-European currency turmoil. After that, in the run-up to AMU, these kind of things disappeared. Some Europeans forget that life before the euro was not always that easy. Um, then we had the Asian financial crisis. Um, we had um, bubbles bursting, and we had the global financial crisis and the euro debt crisis. So um, I have seen a lot of that. And all of these events had different causes, different effects. Only very few people saw these different crises coming. Um, and I think that's a feature of a financial crisis. They jump up um, of seemingly nowhere, but they can spread rapidly. So, and that's why it's not an easy answer um, for the question whether we are ready for the next crisis because we don't know when it happens. Um, but certainly Europe has worked very hard after the Euro debt crisis to remedy the flaws that this period brought to light. And I believe we are now in a much stronger position, both economically and institutionally, um, than before the crisis. And I will say a few words on, on, on why I have that view. But let me first say something about politics, which plays a big role, of course. And all this, a year, a year ago, when you think back, Britain had just voted to leave the EU. The Dutch and French elections were coming up, and it looked as if populist parties could soon be running these countries on a clear anti-European agenda. There were skeptics who predicted the end of the EU about a year ago, just like the end of the euro had regularly been predicted over the previous um, years. But that sentiment now has completely changed. Investors are seeing Europe as a safe haven for their money. They tell them that time and ago, time and time again, when I travel around the world to meet investors, which is part of my job, I have to sell ESM bonds, so I'm a salesman. Um, but it gives me that advantage of talking to the biggest investors in the world. And for them, the sentiment on Europe has changed completely. As I said, safe haven. Um, investors are seeing Europe as a safe place to put their money. Um, and they value what they see right now. There's political stability, let's say, on continental Europe, to be more precise. In the UK, uncertainty is much higher because of the Brexit. In the US, the Trump administration has raised question marks about all kinds of things, not only economic policy, and um, you know much more about that living here, many of you, than I do. Um, of course, politics in Europe continue to change. Germany is heading now for coalition talks that are complex. But I'm convinced that Chancellor Merkel's pro-European policies will continue, whatever the outcome of those coalition talks. There are also more elections coming up. There's Austria on Sunday. Um, there will be Italy early next year. But I think we should have no illusion. Elections are a normal thing. Um, in the EU, at the moment, we are 28 countries, maybe 27 soon, but um, 
and in the euro area we are 19 and um, these countries share to to share some sovereignty but they still have their national elections and that can be disruptive but it's part of democracy so we should not complain too much about it and i think looking back one can see very clearly that many people in the markets um, and maybe some people outside um, Europe were just too, too um, skeptical, too negative on what the possible outcomes would be. Um, looking back, I think that's quite clear. Um, of course, policymakers have a hard job these days, whether we have a global backlash against globalization certainly in the advanced economies. Um, to explain the benefits of globalization is not easy. Um, but here we have some good news um, in the euro area. The popularity of the euro is at record highs. In May of this year, 73% of the people who live in the monetary union said they were in favor of the single currency. And that's the highest support rate since 2004. In every member state of the euro area, there's a clear majority of the people supporting the euro. These numbers show that citizens have understood, at least in this area, the benefits of cross-border cooperation. And I believe that gives politicians a mandate to continue to defend the monetary union and to continue the work to make the euro area more robust and more resilient. After this introduction, talking many about politics, let me return to the main topic of the day, the question whether the euro area is ready for the next crisis. I will first look at Europe's strong points in three areas, the current economic situation, the fiscal position, and the health of the banking sector. On each of these topics, I will mention a few areas that can still be improved. And then at the end of my remarks, I will focus on ways to deepen monetary union and to make it more resilient. So let me start with the current economic situation. The euro area grew at a faster pace than the US in five of the last eight quarters. Um, it's not that we are particularly proud because we grow a bit faster than the US, but um, it's good to remember that um, when you look at GDP, per capita growth that until the crisis hit in 2009, the euro area and the United States were growing at the same speed, which means the welfare of the people was going up at the same speed because you have to look at GDP per capita to measure, obviously, the standard of living. That was growing at the same speed. Um, we are returning to that, given that we have a large output gap than the US for why we can even have faster growth. Um, but when I look at trend growth, whether it's calculated by one of the big international institutions or by, by private um, 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 advisory services, basically they all come to the same conclusion that looking forward, trend growth, potential growth, again, will be the same in the US and the euro area, um, which is good, but for me also not surprising because Western Europe, the US, are advanced economies. Um, GDP per capita growth is um, the result of technological change that um, leads to productivity gains. And it's not surprising that over time this happens at the same speed in the two regions, not every year, but on average um, over time. Macroeconomic imbalances within the euro area which were an important cause of the euro crisis, have decreased significantly. Most countries have regained competitiveness as nominal unit labor costs converged to more sustainable levels. Former program countries in particular made good progress in this area, correcting years of excessive wage increases. The unsustainably high current account deficits from before the crisis have disappeared. To prevent such imbalances from building up again, the European Commission has now been vested with powers to monitor the situation and take action if needed 
through what is called the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, something that did not exist before the crisis. Let me add a word about Europe's social model. With Europe has a strong safety net for those who need it. It is superior in dealing with the negative side effects of globalization. I think that's something we understand more today. Um, economists always knew that globalization and more trade has negative side effects for some, but I think we neglected a bit um, to deal with that. Um, and in Europe, I think it's um, good to see that income equality is the best of any large region in the world. It's better than anywhere by far. It did not deteriorate much during the crisis, while it continued to deteriorate in the US and China the last 10 years. Um, and um, I think this European social and welfare model, which was often criticized in the past, also for good reasons, it had to be streamlined, it had to be made more, more efficient, I think um, deals better with these unintended side effects of globalization than other social models. So that is a strong point, an inherent strength we have in Europe that is valuable. Also looking at labor markets, um, there's an important point, I think I made it already when I was here last time, maybe a year, year and a half ago, that looking at unemployment rates is not enough. We all know unemployment rate in Europe is probably still about twice as high in the US, although it has been coming down. Um, but what is not so well known is that the employment rate has been going up in Europe over the last 15, 16 years, since the year 2000, since the Lisbon strategy was created in Europe. Um, and with a higher employment rate today than in the year 2000, it means that a higher percentage of the population actually has a job than in the year 2000. As you know, in the US, the employment and participation rate has been falling. So these are all positive things um, um, that I think complement the picture and the, the better growth rates that everybody talks about in the city this week because the WIO came out. Um, but there are still problems, of course, in Europe. Um, one is that we have a low potential output rate, as I said, partly um, as a result of the poor demographics. Um, but so we do know that growth can only come from productivity gains in the future. <coughs> Therefore, we need structural reforms in all countries in the EU or in Europe, not just in those that were under ESM assistance programs. Um, Europe needs also to further increase the participation rate of women in the labor force. It's very good in the Nordic countries, but in other countries one has room for improvement. The mandatory and effective retirement age needs to be raised in order to, to help on the labor supply side, otherwise there will be a real drop very soon. And of course, strong investment would also help potential output growth. Um, looking at the poor demographics, um, um, one can also look at the immigration situation. Um, and it will be crucial now for many countries to integrate the immigrants that came over the last few years into the labor force. If that um, turns out to be possible, it would be a real win-win situation. We need it from the demographic side anyway, um, and it would be good for everybody. Um, and we know that without immigration, the population of countries such as Germany and Austria would already be shrinking today. So it's not shrinking because of immigrants. But now the key economic question is whether we are able to integrate them into the labor force. Another area where Europe or the Euro area, to be more specific, needs to do better is economic risk sharing. Risk sharing is a sum of mechanisms through which a shock, a positive or a negative shock, is transmitted from one country's economy um, to others. It helps to smooth business cycles and makes national economies more resilient um, and would thus make also the Euro area as a whole more resilient. In the US, but also in countries such as Germany and France, economic risk sharing is much higher than in the Euro area as a whole. 
Risk sharing can take place through fiscal means, fiscal channels, or through market channels. And both channels need to be widened in the euro area. One of the reasons for poor economic risk sharing is a drop in financial integration that happened during the crisis. During that period, the home bias of banks increased significantly. Shortly after the euro had been introduced, financial integration rose quickly in Europe, but it crashed during the crisis. It has now recovered somewhat, but it is still well below its peak. And one likely explanation is that banks are still weighed down by a large amount of non-performing loans, which are a legacy of the crisis. I will say something about that in a minute. But let me first turn to the fiscal situation. Fiscal situation in the monetary union, public deficits jumped after the global financial crisis, as agreed at the time by all G20 member states in 2009. So fiscal policy actually um, played a strong role to get out of the crisis. Between 2007 and 2010, the aggregate fiscal deficit of the euro area increased by six percentage points. During the last few years, public deficits have been reduced again and converged to a narrow range. The aggregate fiscal deficit of the euro area as a whole is around 1.5%. And the euro area debt to GDP ratio was 91% last year, and it is falling. And these numbers are much better than what we see in the US, in the UK, or Japan, whether you look at the fiscal deficit side. Deficits are twice or three times as high as they are in the euro area. And the debt um, continues to go up, certainly in Japan and in the US. And this means that the euro area has created more fiscal space than the other large economies. Um, and that's one important aspect when you think about whether we are ready for the next crisis. In Europe, on the fiscal side, we are certainly better prepared than others. What also helps on the fiscal side is that um, the favorable financing conditions from the ESM, so my institution, um, for countries that borrowed from us large amounts, um, helps them to pay very low interest rates. It's a very small debt service payment they have to do. That's how they can regain um, debt sustainability. But it also helps them to recreate fiscal space. So particularly those vulnerable countries or countries that were vulnerable and were hit particularly by the crisis are helped significantly by the very favorable lending terms that the ESM can offer. In the case of Greece, for instance, which received more money from EFSF and ESM than any other country, they save every year in their budget 10 billion euro of debt service payments, and that's 5.5% of Greek GDP. Let me look also at the financial sector. European banks have recovered after the crisis, just like banks in other parts of the world. The system is safer now. Bank capital has doubled the last 10 years, and profitability is returning though it is still below the levels in the US. Non-performing loans are large, but they are coming down from a peak in 2013. Every year they are coming down a bit. And they are well provisioned. Still, they are too high, particularly in some countries. This means the financial sector is not optimally efficient. Managing NPLs not only eats up capital that could otherwise be used for providing credit. It also means that valuable management time is needed to manage these portfolios. Time that could otherwise possibly be spent on developing the business model or, for instance, on strategic acquisitions also across borders. And there is room for consolidation in the financial sector in many European countries. Ultimately, therefore, NPLs are one of the reasons why euro area financial integration remains low. Low financial integration means 
less economic risk sharing through markets, therefore reducing non-performing loans is a priority, not just because of the banking sector, but also for the broader functioning of the economy. European ministers, European finance ministers in July adopted an action plan to deal with non-performing loans and the ECB is also working on that. So this is all welcome. So I have summarized so far some strong points of the current economy, of the fiscal situation and of the financial sector. But I also did not, not want to hide the problems that we face in Europe. Um, it's not as if everything was fine. I have mentioned some of our weaknesses that need to be addressed and I hope will be addressed. But let me now talk about further AMU deepening to make the euro area from that side more robust and more resilient. Looking far back, 1951, that's really when European integration started. France and Germany and four other countries decided to give up part of their sovereignty, the first step to jointly govern their coal and steel market. That sounds pretty easy today, but at the time, it was a daunting idea. Only a few, year, few years after the atrocious way those particular those two countries um, fought against each other. In 1957, there was the next step with the creation of the European Economic Community. There were other steps like the single market um, created in the second half of the 80s, signed in 92. And in 1999, a number of countries adopted the single currency, the euro. From an economic point of view, all this, this made a lot of sense. Without these integration steps, the current economic situation wouldn't look as favorable as it is. Europe is committed to multilateral cooperation because it knows its benefits. And the two have always gone hand in hand. And this explains why Europe fought so hard to protect the integrity of monetary union during the crisis by setting up the ESM, for instance, and by creating the banking union with a single supervisor and a resolution authority. Those steps would have been unthinkable only a few years ago. Europe made important progress because the crisis required it. Of course, other factors were at play as well. Countries that lost market access or were close to losing market access did their homework by reining in public deficits, regaining competitiveness through painful um, wage cuts and by modernizing their economies. And of course, the ECB's unorthodox policy measures played a crucial role in calming markets at a time it was most needed. Because of this comprehensive policy response, Europe is now in a much stronger position. Any remaining steps to finalize monetary union and to make the economy more resilient are relatively small by comparison. And I'm convinced that we will see some steps next year because of our commitment to multilateral cooperation, which is only reinforced by what we see happening in the UK and the US. The favorable pro-European results of this year's election point in the same direction. But that doesn't mean that we are quietly setting up a United States of Europe. There are no federal sentiments in Europe overall. I may have some personally, but um, the large majority of the population does not. Um, so there will be no full political union. There's also no appetite for full fiscal union with larger transfers between countries. And I'm convinced the full political and a full fiscal union are not required for a good functioning of monetary union. It is true that transfers are important to promote real convergence among countries. But the existing EU budget already allows for significant transfers from rich to poor countries. The EU budget was set up that way 
um, since, the, since 1957, rich countries pay more money into the budget than they get out, and poor countries get out more than they pay in. And for the poor countries, this can amount up to 4% of their respective GDP. Because sometimes people argue the EU budget is very small, it cannot do very much. But when you look how much net transfers poor countries receive, it's up to 4%. It varies year by year. I looked at the numbers um, recently, and I saw that in 2014, for instance, Hungary received 5.4% of its GDP. I don't know why Hungary and why 2014. But um, that's what the numbers are, 5.4% in net transfers out of the EU budget. So it's a big amount of money. And I don't think one needs to add to that. Maybe it can be made more efficient with how this money is spent. If everybody wants, one can also add a bit to it. But it's not as the debate sometimes suggests that we need to create something completely new here. It exists through the EU budget. If the EU budget did not exist, we would probably have a different debate in the monetary union about transfers. Um, but we have the EU budget. It will get a bit smaller without the UK, but it will continue to operate in that way. Also, it's worth to remember what I just said about Greece and other countries. Those countries that received loans from the EFSF and ESM at very favorable interest rates, they get the equivalent of a transfer through those very um, low interest rates. I also think we don't need a large additional budget in the euro area to counter deep symmetric shocks. Some people have suggested that, particularly in the city. Um, I think that's not needed because Europe has demonstrated um, that in truly exceptional cases, like in 2008 and 2009, we can successfully fight a crisis through a simultaneous increase in fiscal deficits as we did in 2009 and 10. That was a collective decision. It's um, actually covered by the Stability and Growth Pact. It's not a breach of the pact. Um, it has an escape clause. It was there from the beginning, and that was activated at that moment, and I think that was absolutely justified. While I'm at what we don't need in the euro area, we don't, so as I said, we don't need additional transfers. We don't need a facility to counter symmetric shocks. I also don't think we need something completely new to promote investment. We have many instruments already. We have the European Investment Bank. We have the Juncker Plan. We have the EU budget. All that possibly can be improved. The efficiency could be improved. Maybe the amount can be increased. But again, it's not as if something completely new needs to be invented. Now I come to those um, um, measures that would be useful to take. Um, and um, I will start with banking union. That should be completed. And we know that after the single supervisor was created and the single resolution board, there are two things missing. Um, a backstop for the single resolution fund that could be provided by the ESM. And I'm confident that that will happen sometime next year. The technical work has progressed quite significantly on that. Um, to complete banking union, we also need a European deposit insurance scheme of some sort. There are different models. Um, this is more controversial, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for ideological reasons. Um, it is true that the national deposit insurance schemes which exist in every country are very different, so just one cannot just throw them together overnight. Um, the other reason is that it, why it will take some time is that there are legacy issues in some banks in certain countries and there's no appetite in other countries to pay for that. So legacy issues need to be sorted out, um, which is happening one by one when you read, and you probably have seen that, that um, during the summer Italy um, sorted out three more banks in northern Italy. Spain um, dealt with one problem bank. So those are examples that legacy issues are being dealt with. Um, and in the process, um, problems are reduced. Interestingly, for instance, when you look at Italian NPL numbers, there's about a 15% drop from the spring to now because of these three banks that were 
um, resolved. So that had a big impact on the number of NPLs in Italy. So it's happening. And that's why I'm also optimistic that um, we will get to the common deposit insurance one day. It would also be good to work on the capital markets union. It's um, high on the agenda of the European Commission because that would, together with the completion of banking union, also increase risk sharing via markets in Europe. That's why it's an important issue. Capital markets union is interesting because it's politically not very controversial, but technically very complex because one has to harmonize to some extent insolvency laws, um, commercial law, tax laws, and um, that is not easy. Um, so it's good to work on it, but because it's complex, it will take some time. Once we get there, it will help increasing risk sharing. Turning to the fiscal issues, there is a debate about simplifying the EU fiscal rules. Initially, the stability and growth pact was relatively simple. It became more complex over times. On the one hand, rules became tighter, but at the same time, a number of exceptions and flexibilities were added, and there are not too many people left who understand the system. And that's never good for credibility. Um, so I think there is a reason to work on it. People have um, understood that, and um, that will be one important um, strand of work. The other important question is fiscal capacity for the euro area. I already talked about all the ideas that I don't find necessary. Um, so no additional transfers, no facilities for symmetric shocks or, or promoting investment. Um, but what I don't see in the monetary union today is a facility to deal with asymmetric shocks. Um, it just doesn't exist except ESM programs for the real big crisis. But um, there can be, or it could be useful to have a facility that deals um, with smaller crises or with, with business cycles that diverge a little bit too much um, without immediately lead, leading to a loss of market access for the respective countries. That if one follows that idea that such a facility would be useful, then one can think about different ways to, to do it and the United States um, I think offers some examples here, rainy day funds that many of the US states have. Um, similar economic effect can be reached by, by having a complementary unemployment insurance. Again, uh, most US states have that. Um, so there are ideas, but I think first we need the debate in Europe to agree that there is a gap um, to deal with asymmetric shocks. I think that is the biggest hurdle at the moment. Then we also deal in Europe with a number of institutional questions um, for the euro area. First, I'm sure you heard about it, um, whether we should have a permanent president of the euro group or a euro area finance minister. This could have certain advantages, um, certainly in the area of external representation in international fora, G7, G20, IMF, um, to have a face here. I think could be, could be very attractive. But then it depends what other mandates this person would get, um, whether that person could interfere in national budgets, which is a very difficult proposition, or at least to coordinate better economic and, and fiscal policies. Um, so the way I see this question is that first, we will have the debate on a possible mandate for a European finance minister and then we will decide who is the right person. So that's probably not imminent. Um, there are many who want first to decide on a person and then on the mandate. Um, um, so I think the other way around is what, what will happen. A second institutional question um, that was, for instance, mentioned in President Macron's speech is to create a subgroup um, of the European Parliament where only um, the members of parliament from Euro area countries would, would meet. So it would not be a new body, but it would be a subgroup of the existing body. Um, I think that has certain attractions. It might help with the um, accountability of everything related to Euro area policies. 
um, where the European Parliament at the moment has no direct say. Um, however, it's also clear that national parliaments will continue to have a say over ESM lending because the risk that is taken on when we provide financing to a country is taken on by national budgets. And that's why national parliaments um, want to have a say on that. I think that's understandable and I don't see that moving to the European Parliament. And then the third institutional aspect is um, a discussion to develop the ESM towards the European Monetary Fund. Um, that debate is in full swing. We had a discussion in the Eurogroup that met two days ago on Monday in, in Luxembourg on that topic of um, how to strengthen the, um, the ESM. It, it's the beginning of a discussion. There were no, dis no decisions taken. There was not even a conclusion drawn um, in that meeting of the 19 Euro area finance ministers. But I see a growing consensus that the ESM should play a stronger role um, in future crisis programs. As you know, in the past, when the crisis broke and we had the first adjustment programs, there was a troika with the IMF, the European Commission, and the ECB. And um, more recently, the ESM joined that troika. So in Greece, we are now a quartet, um, which is also a bit tough sometimes on the Greek side to have four institutions sitting there. Um, and there's, on the one hand, the feeling that the IMF is a little bit withdrawing from Europe, um, which you can certainly see on the financing side. Initially, the IMF contributed one third to the programs financially. Um, then a few years ago, that dropped to 10% in the case of the second Greek program and the Cypriot program. It was 10% from them, 90% from the ESM in the case of Greece. In the last two years, there has been no money flowing. And we also, of course, take note that in the IMF board, there's a lot of criticism from some non-European chairs that the IMF has been too much engaged in Europe. So one sees a kind of withdrawal of the IMF from, from Europe. I think the ECB also wants to be less associated with these programs. So after this debate on Monday, I think um, we are moving in that direction that in a future crisis, and hopefully not so soon, um, we will have two institutions taking care of designing and monitoring conditionality, that's the European Commission and the ESM. So that would be one important um, development. There are other tasks that the ESM could take on, new facilities. Um, one will probably be the backstop for the um, SRF, the Single Resolution Fund, um, if there were a fiscal capacity for the euro area, it is something that could be done, could be managed by the ESM, but I'm not looking for more work. We, we are busy enough in Luxembourg, um, but it's a possibility. Um, there's also a question how to organize burden sharing um, in a more predictable and transparent way in the euro area in the future. We could also play a role here. So there are different possibilities, again, um, nothing decided. It's the beginning of a debate which will continue. The Eurogroup, which meets on a regular basis every month, in a crisis they meet every week, or twice a week sometimes. Um, during the next two months, they will continue to discuss possibilities to deepen AMU, and all that will be reported then, then to the Euro Summit in December. I don't expect decisions then, because very likely the new German government will not be in place and therefore will not be able to, to take a final decision, but it will be an important step to discuss all these items. And um, I think that the year 2018 is then a good year to come to some decisions on some of these items. And when that happens, Europe will be even better prepared for the next crisis. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, it's a great honor for, for me to be able to speak after Klaus Regling and 
and to offer a little bit of, of a perspective on what he said. So basically, I think this is a really significant speech. It's, it's uh, certainly by far the most detailed analysis uh, of the status quo and of how to improve it that I've ever heard from uh, Klaus Riegling. And so for this reason, I'm not really going to uh, offer you know, my, my own ideas. So what I'm going to give to you is mainly a commentary on uh, Klaus's uh, speech. And uh, fortunately, I, I, I did have a, a, a copy of the speech about three hours ago. So I was able to you know, come up with my, my little commentary. <laughs> I listened very carefully. <laughs> so um, this is uh, a summary of the argument. Uh, so basically, there are three main points. One is that significant progress has indeed been made in the euro area. So that's true both with respect to addressing economic problems. Uh, fiscal and external imbalances have, have indeed declined. Competitiveness has been reestablished, and we have a much safer financial system, better capitalized banks. We also have a cyclical recovery that is now clearly there and very broad. And finally, we have some quite successful institution building, primarily in the Arab Banking Union, but of course the creation of the ESM itself belongs in that category. Then um, the managing director's second point was that vulnerabilities remain. Uh, so there's high unemployment, and this also has a, a political dimension. So it, if you like, limits the social room or social space for uh, austerity or great you know, crisis resolution efforts going forward. Uh, we do have legacy problems with respect to debt, both uh, in the private sector and uh, sovereign debt. And then indeed, you know, financial integration um, is uh, not back, uh, particularly with respect to the concentration of sovereign debt in, in banks. Um, and, and so uh, for this reason alone, there is limited uh, risk sharing. There's in some sense less risk sharing which, than we had uh, before the crisis, except through the institution of the, of the ESM. And so we do need further reform. Uh, we do need to complete the banking union. We do need to build a capital markets union. We need to simplify fiscal rules. We uh, need a facility to stabilize asymmetric uh, shocks, although um, Klaus's view is that we do not need uh, such a facility for symmetric shocks. And finally, we would like to upgrade the ESM to play an IMF-like role, including, so this was a quote from the version that I had, possibly in organizing burden sharing in a more uh, transparent way. And so, you know, my basic reaction to it is, is I agree with almost everything. So I think it's, it's a very nuanced and, and convincing analysis, and, and so are the policy implications. And so what I'm going to give you in about another, say, eight to ten minutes is just one small point of disagreement, and then I will talk about two things that are just not in the speech, uh, and those I call the, the two elephants in the room. Now... I, I don't mean to criticize the fact that they're not in the speech. They cannot be in the speech. It's not uh, Managing Director Regling's role to talk about these problems, but it's, it's my role to talk about these problems. So in a sense, it's the value added that I can bring to you. So let, let me get the small point of disagreement uh, out of the way. So, so basically, I agree with the logic that for symmetric shocks of a certain nature, namely sharp external disruptive events that force the entire euro area into a recession, we do have a tool. And that's the tool that was used in 2008-2009, which is to suspend the deficit limits of the Stability and Growth Pact and organize some coordinated reflation. So completely agreed that we do have this tool. But there is a broader meaning of symmetric shocks, which has to do not so much with a sharp clearly defined outside event that then forces everyone into recession, but it's more about a protracted lack of demand. It's sort of a, a, a stagnation uh, phenomenon in which the ECB, in spite of increasingly aggressive monetary policy, is unable to restore euro area inflation to its target. And, and so this is, I think, where it would have been good uh, to have more fiscal action uh, in the euro area. So I'm particularly talking about the years 2013 to 2015, but you know, it lingers on to some, some extent. 
And we do not have such an instrument. The reason we don't have such an instrument is because you cannot push on a string. So we could potentially loosen um, the deficit constraints for the countries that have hit the 3% limit, but we cannot force Germany to expand, right? And, and for this reason, I do think that having a euro area fiscal capacity that could then borrow and, and provide that fiscal stimulus would be uh, a good idea. Okay, so that's the only thing I'm going to say on the, on the fiscal side. Now to the two elephants. So, you know, this is a, um, a, a speech about European crisis risks and whether we are ready for the next crisis. And so when, when I hear that, I immediately think of two things. The, the first is the Italian problem. So sovereign debt is, is, is high in Italy, and even though Italy is recovering, interest rates are also rising. And so what about you know, if that were to develop into a problem. I mean, clearly, even though these reform ideas that Klaus has explained are all very good, they would come too late uh, for an Italian uh, problem. So we need to sort of reflect on whether that is a threat or not. And then, you know, the more fundamental, more long-term elephant in the room is, is German views on EMU reform, and particularly the issue of market discipline, which uh, conflicts, I would say, not, not with everything that uh, Klaus has explained, but with quite a great deal of it. So how can we reconcile those views or put it differently? What are the chances that a reform package, uh, such as the managing director has described, uh, is actually going to be adopted in the euro area? Okay, so elephant number one, could rising interest rates render Italian debt unsustainable? And, and so here, you know, I've given this to you partly as a straw man, uh, because I think that actually the news on this is mostly good. Uh, so in, in June, I, uh, July, I, I wrote a little policy brief with Olivier Blanchard where we go through the numbers here for Italy and for some other high debt countries. And basically on Italy, we conclude that rising interest rates uh, are very unlikely to trigger an Italian sovereign debt problem, mainly because of the way or the reason why they would rise. And the reason why they would rise is because your area growth recovers. And that is also good for Italian growth, and so would Italian, strengthen uh, Italian solvency. And so it's very hard to think that rising interest rates through that channel are going to create a problem. Moreover, if you think about it sort of in a, in a more formal sense, uh, debt sustainability, sustainability in, in Italy is really something that depends on long-term growth and long-term borrowing costs, and so a cyclical recovery of both growth, uh, growth and interest rates is not going to do very much. Uh, to um, change that. Now you may think, well, but markets may not be so sanguine, right? So markets may think, well, Italy, Italy faces higher interest rates, this could lead potentially to a rollover problem, even if it doesn't, strictly speaking, weaken debt sustainability. So, you know, what would happen if markets, you know, maybe for the wrong reasons, uh, lose confidence? And so our conclusion on that is that it's a problem we could deal with. Uh, and so, so this is really, if you like, the um, uh, he, here you can, sense, this is a meaningful sense in which the financial architecture improvements that we have had in the Eurozone in the past few years really would bring some fruit. Uh, be because we could deal with an Italian uh, debt run and we could deal through it through a combination of an ESM program backstopped by the OMT without having to restructure Italian debt. And, and the reason why I say that with, with a fair amount of confidence is because the counter-argument that is made and that would usually indicate that one needs a restructuring uh, does not really apply in the case of Italy. And that counter-argument is that you would need, if you like, an excessive amount of fiscal adjustment more than is plausible for a two or three year uh, program uh, to save Italy, and that's just not true. So if you compare the numbers, for example, to the fiscal effort that Greece uh, uh, needed to do in 2010 in order to uh, uh, restore itself to sustainability, and which in my view was uh, unrealistic and excessive, or even to the uh, required fiscal adjustment uh, that would be needed in Japan today if Japan were to face a loss of market conference, Italy is in a completely different uh, league. And, and the reason is that Italy has already done quite a lot of fiscal adjustment and so its uh, primary surplus uh, is already uh, there. Uh, and you know, depending on 
what you assume for real borrowing costs and depending on how fast you want debt to decline. Of course, it would need to, need to do some fiscal adjustment on top of that, but nothing that could not be delivered within a standard uh, program. So that on the, on the first point. Now, the elephant in the room number two and the one that I'm more worried about is the German negotiating position on EMU, which is inconsistent with most of, well, maybe I would say at least half of the reforms suggested by, by the managing director. I mean, as you well know, uh, the essence of the German position is that, that most problems that we have in the euro area are national, and they can be solved by applying stronger incentives at the national level, particularly on fiscal discipline and to spur structural reform, and that most of the reforms that are suggested at the EMU level are in fact counterproductive uh, because they would reduce uh, these incentives, in particular by mutualizing the cost of bad national policy decisions in the fiscal area and perhaps uh, decisions affecting the, the soundness of banks. And so this is why both European deposit insurance and European fiscal capacity are rejected uh, by Germany. And then there's also this view that, you know, <clears throat> Aggregate re demand really doesn't matter all that much, and, and particularly if you try to control it, you usually get the timing wrong, and so you should not really try uh, to uh, come up with, uh, if you like, counter-cyclical um, uh, public um, instruments at the European level. And then there is a point which didn't figure at all, except hidden in this little quote that I showed at the beginning in, in Klaus Regling's speech, and this is a, an incredibly tough even for my standards, right, and I've been supporting sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms for years now, an incredibly tough existence, uh, insistence on debt restructuring, including an automatic maturity extension of sovereign bonds as a condition for access to ESM lending. So the, the source of all these uh, quotes and statements is this by now famous German on paper, which I think was the basis, uh, or it, I, I'm, I hear was circulated at the Eurogroup meeting that, that Klaus was referring to uh, earlier. So the question is, is, is there any room for compromise given this very hard line uh, position? And, and so first of all, if you read the document also more carefully, there is actually room for compromise on a few specific issues. So clearly, Capital Markets Union is something that everyone agrees to in principle. So we can open negotiations on it, or we can deep negotiations on it, but the devil's in the details. Like Klaus said, it requires lots and lots of harmonization of domestic law. So it's going to be hard, but in principle, we can give it a shot. Uh, one of the positive surprises of the German non-paper is that actually, it actually endorses simplifying fiscal rules under certain conditions, as long as debt is on a declining path. You know, what, whether that's nominal, whether it's a share of GDP, I'm not sure. I mean, it may be quite a tough condition, but at least the idea of simplifying fiscal rules is something that uh, apparently the Germans are now open to, and that, that's a good step, because so far the idea of simplification of fiscal rules was always viewed as a shorthand for watering down uh, fiscal rules. So this is good. Obviously, we do have, in principle, a consensus in Europe on a stronger role for the ESM. That's also good. Behind this, of course, are very different ideas of how the ESM exactly should be strengthened, and particularly the role uh, in surveillance uh, that the ESM should play, and to what extent it should take over surveillance roles uh, from the Commission, which is what the Germans hope, but I think most of the rest of Europe would not like. Uh, I think that th there is some openness on the German side for a rainy day fund, it's not in this document that I'm describing, but if this is conditional, possibly tied to reform, and does not include a borrowing capacity, it is uh, potentially there. And there is also openness for giving the ESM uh, a backstop role in bank resolution, assuming, and I'm again quoting from this paper, further significant risk reduction, including the regulatory treatment of sovereign bonds. And so the bottom line is that Germany may, in fact, accept more fiscal rules, flexible rules, uh, and, and a little more fiscal risk sharing, including the backstop, but only in return for a ton more market discipline. And that's where the problem is, because a ton more market discipline is something that can be highly destabilizing at a time when bank balance sheets are still weak and sovereign debt is still high. And so it will be very ironic if, by trying to make Europe more crisis-proof, we trigger, trigger the next crisis, and there's a well-known precedent for this, the famous Deauville 
speech walk of Chancellor Merkel and President Sarkozy. And so this sounds like, you know, we are, we're going to go on a new uh, beach walk. And so, you know, the Italians are understandably uh, worried. So my final slide. Is, is there any solution to this dilemma? So we, we have a little exercise. We've done a little exercise in a group of 15 economists, about half and half from France and Germany. This is, it was, I think, circulated outside, where we sort of explore how the compromise could look like in principle, and, and roughly, you know, the idea is we combine more risk sharing with more market discipline, but we have to do it in a way that is phased in very carefully to avoid financial and, and fiscal uh, disruptions. And, and so the, the key problem here is that, you know, we may, we may just be able to agree on a common vision for the future. But, you know, in getting there, we have to start from the present. And the present is a bad place to start from, right? To, uh, a quote uh, this um, possibly Irish, but I've also heard it might be Scottish. I'm not sure exactly who has the, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Maine, Maine, okay. All right, and, and so the, the key here is the following. So start with this very concrete, explicit condition in the German non-paper. We are only going to agree to a fiscal backstop, and they don't even talk about deposit insurance, right? I mean, by extension, certainly deposit insurance would be subject to the same condition if we reduce the bank holdings of sovereign bonds, the exposures for their own sovereigns, and they want to do it through regulatory means. You know, but doing this through regulatory means at a time when part of the demand for sovereign bonds in Europe is from these banks would very likely uh, trigger higher yields and, and a crisis. And, and so, you know, even if you just take this, this very narrow sense uh, in which uh, we want to create a more market discipline, which is to sort of break the uh, dependence of, of banks on the sovereigns and, and vice versa, and most ec economies would agree that this is a key, you inevitably face the problem of how to do it in the way that does not uh, blow up in your face. And so the f feasibility of a compromise on euro area reform depends on on solving this transition problem. And so this is technically and conceptually really difficult. So I, I think it can be done. I have actually written about how it could be done. But my ideas on how to do this so far always involve the creation of some sort of safe asset in the euro area that is offered to banks as a substitute for um, national bonds and uh, that would absorb some of the demand for the national bonds. And that, in turn, turns out to be another red line for the Germans. So this is what I think progress will depend on. Thank you. Thank you, German. Thank you, Klaus. Um, if I could ask Klaus to come up and take the central seat in German to go over there on the uh, far left edge where he belongs. Um, and. Um, We'll start matters uh, as we get seated with if Klaus chooses to respond to anything German said, then I'll put a couple things and then we'll open it to uh, all of you. Klaus, as a European public servant, no, not for a long time now a German public servant, you, you no one expects you to speak for the non-paper. Um, but if you would like to make any responses to Jeremy's characterization of the system, please do. Yes, um, certainly. Thank you. I will. And um, you're right. I'm I'm a Euro European. I, I have not lived in Germany for the last 18 years, and before that, I lived 10 years in, in right. Washington. So um, I spend most of my professional life outside, which sometimes helps. Sometimes um, one may lose touch a bit and. Jerome has been more recently living in, in Berlin, and maybe that's why he is a bit more skeptical. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so let me say a few words on, on his analysis. Thank you very much for being um, relatively kind to my speech. Um, on the um, small disagreement, um, I think it's, it's really very small um, because um, um, the proposal that, for instance, um, the IMF at one point did to create a facility in the euro area for symmetric shocks, 
Um, that's something that I interpreted as being reserved for what happened in 2009, 10, 11. Um, and there, I think, indeed, we, we demonstrate that we are able to act. And Germany, that traditionally is reluctant on using um, fiscal stimulus, um, was not reluctant at all at that point. The situation was just so bad. Mm. And maybe in that sense, I still have some German genes, because I wrote articles in, in November 2008 that this was the moment where fiscal stimulus was necessary. And I also said that this was the first time in my professional life that I had advocated fiscal stimulus, <laughs> um, because I'm not in favor of doing it whenever there's a dip in GDP. Um, but it was so bad, it was just beyond doubt that it was necessary. And I think um, we all agree on that one. And then if it's less necessary, of course, um, then the disagreements get bigger. On the two elephants, I agree with your analysis on Italy. I read some months ago with great interest the blog you did with Olivier Blanchard. I thought it was very good. Um, we had come to very similar conclusions at CESM, because we always have to look with where are potential customers. And so um, the conclusion was very similar, um, that um, Italy can manage. Of course, it's not a guarantee. It um, depends on who is in charge and who is in the next government. And make mistakes happen, accidents happen. Um, but um, given all the positives that you mentioned, I don't want to repeat that, compared to, to Japan, for instance, um, um, it's, it's doable. Then on Germany, um, of, here you enter now, of course, a um, very speculative area. We don't know who will be in the next government. We don't know who will be the next finance minister. Um, you said German views are inconsistent with most of my proposals. That, I think, is not true, because you also added a few, like the backstop working on, on capital markets union, um, rainy day fund under certain conditions. But those are the conditions under which rainy day funds operate in the US. And so that is a valuable model. That's one reason I'm advocating that. So I think that is possible. But we are speculating. We don't know. But what I also sense in a much broader um, um, sense that Berlin is also responding to the very dynamic ideas of President Macron. And President Macron, I think, is shaking up his own country um, in reforming France, the economy, but also with his European ideas. And he talked about those ideas during the election campaign. He was elected, so he has a mandate from the French voters to push for this. And that has left some impression also in Berlin. Um, does not mean that on every point there's enthusiastic um, applause immediately. But um, I think my feeling is that this provides the basis to move in certain areas where people would have said six months ago this will never happen. So I'm not that pessimistic, but I'm, I'm an optimist by, by nature. I cannot promise you what will happen. But coming to the last point where you are particularly pessimistic on, um, you mentioned Deauville, um, which was very disruptive at the time. Um, and you quote my, my half sentence when I said um, it would be useful to think about a more predictable and transparent way of how to deal with debt restructurings. This is, in a way, the opposite of Deauville. Because Deauville came as a surprise. It was not prepared. There was no. It is not to criticize the two, two walkers on the beach of Deauville. Um, there was just no system when the crisis hit. And that's why in, in Ireland, for instance, the entire problems from the bank balance sheets went to the public sector balance sheet, because there was nothing. Um, and only slowly over time, Deauville was one important moment. We have been developing um, some, some more predictable system, but I think we are not at the end of that. There was bail-in, certainly in 2012, for Greece. Private creditors took the biggest haircut in history. We saw bail-in massively in, in Cyprus from, from bank creditors. We have seen it now in some banks in Spain, for instance, also some banks in Italy. Um, so we are moving, or we have moved quite a bit. And in my view, 
and I made it very clear also publicly at the press conference after the Eurogroup that um, I'm not in favor of um, any automaticity, which is something the Bundesbank has proposed, that the country that requests an ESM loan um, would see the maturities of its debt automatically extended by three years. I think that's pro-cyclical, um, so that's risky. But I understand the objective of this. And I think, and I'm proposing that, to reach the same objective to go via collective action clauses, the CACs, which were strengthened already a few years ago. Um, since 2013, all um, European government bonds have the stronger CACs, which make it a lot easier to restructure because it's, um, um, the voting is easier. But one could go another step here, and there are proposals from ICMA and the IMF how to do that. And then one could also see a system where, for instance, ESM um, brings together in such a situation the creditors and the debtor to make sure there's a fair solution, fair to everybody. So I think um, um, it's not as if there's a German proposal that's dangerous and there's nothing else. We also have other ways to reach the similar objective and um, I see a lot more support for that than for the automaticity. By the way, the German non-paper was a real non-paper. Um, it was not distributed in the Eurogroup. Um, most people had read it because it was leaked to the media, but it was um, so much a non-paper that it was a non-distributed okay. um, document. Okay, so the non-squared paper. Um, Klaus, we have many of your friends and expert colleagues in the audience, and I want to turn it over to them for questions, but I want to ask two quick things first. I promised you I would contribute. You asked, Wolfgang at least asked me to, so I will. No, under my instruction. Yes, good, 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 good. Um, first question is, both you and German, um, it, to varying degrees, seem to be underlining the distinction between Euro member and non-Euro member EU countries in various ways. And there's obviously economic efficiency arguments and decision-making efficiency arguments for doing that. But are there also not risks to the kind of countries that German used to worry about at the EBRD if we really as President Macron said, we move forward in, in with variable speed and if the euro area really integrates further. I mean, as a European, I understand as ESM, that's not an issue, but as a European, should we be worried about this? Not too much. Um, and I try to speak as a European, obviously the ESM has only the 19 countries that, that use the euro as members. But um, the UK will leave. Um, all, the other Euro area, all the other EU member states except um, Denmark um, have some sort of commitment to join the Euro area and they are all invited to do so once they meet the criteria and I think then even Denmark would do it if they don't want to be the last one left out. Nobody will be forced to join but they are all invited and um, so it's not a permanent um, um, differentiation. If countries decide not to join, then they accept the multi-speed Europe, which we see already today. And if some countries don't want to join, then that would continue. But um, um, I don't think that can be a reason for the euro area not to continue with its integration. And I think that we are coming out of the crisis. The crisis is now behind us. That's why some countries are more reluctant to join or to, to put a date now on when to join. But even during the crisis, we had three new member states in the Euro area and in the ESM. That's quite remarkable. Of course, these are very special countries and the neighborhood to, to Russia makes it particular attractive for them to be a real full member in every respect. Um, but I'm convinced all the other Eastern European countries will join over the next 10 or 15 years. Then there will be new, new EU member states. Croatia joined recently the EU. For them, it will take a bit longer, but they definitely want to join the euro area. They already have a fixed exchange rate. Bulgaria has a currency board. They will all join. I have little doubt about that. So unless they really take a decision they don't want, but then it's their responsibility that there will be 
uh, to speed or multi speed Europe. And market forces will play a role possibly. You, you saw that the biggest um, Nordic banks is um, moving its headquarter from Sweden to Finland for only one reason, because Finland is part of the banking union. Um, so these things will play a role. And so I'm not too worried about this aspect. Uh, another question, thank you. Another question I would just raise, and I'll, I'll try to make it concise without sounding obnoxious. Um, your, your vision in this document, and, to, and again, appropriately given the mission of your five-year-old institution, is about preparing for a crisis, responding to a crisis. Um, there are schools of thought that suggest that problems with monetary union caused the crisis. And in particular, to take what Jeremy said, but go a little further than what he said, it could be argued that the intra-EU, intra-euro area imbalances, surpluses in Germany and elsewhere, were actually a key factor in the crisis. Now, you first trot out your ready arguments for why that is the wrong way to interpret the cause of the crisis. Yeah, sorry. First. First? Okay. <laughs> First, trot out what I'm sure you have ready, your arguments for why that is the wrong interpretation of the crisis, and rather it was the southern, the fiscal follies of the south that caused the crisis. And second, as a result of that, can you expand a little bit on why you feel confident that no further transfers or integration is really that necessary for a monetary union. I understand whether it's you in your current position or our mutual friend, your successor at ECFA, Marco Budi, or our mutual friend, Marco Budi, says this is the hand we're dealt. We have to play it. But that's not the same as a statement that really there, there is no need for further integration in Europe to make it work. Well, starting with your second question, because that's shorter. Um, on the first question, I could give another seminar here. Um, um, I talked about additional steps for integration, and I tried to explain why I don't believe that additional transfers are needed and, and additional facilities for symmetric shocks or investment. Um, but I said what I consider to be to be necessary, completing banking union, have a facility for asthmatic shocks, um, have some institutional development. So it's not if, if I, I'm not saying um, we don't need anything, but I'm very clear that we don't need a full fiscal union or full political union to make monetary union successful. Because if we had a full fiscal and a full political union, that would make my life a lot easier. Um, but that's not an objective in itself. Um, but then we had, would have the United States of Europe, which would be nice. Um, some people like it, but it's a minority. Um, so it's a, people don't want that. But I don't think it's, one can argue that it's really needed. Um, but again, some deepening, I talked about that. So, um, but it's less than some other people believe. That's true. But I, I hope I made my point clear why I believe that um, some of the other proposals are not really needed. Um, going back to your first question, what caused the crisis? Um, I'm not in the camp that of those who say um, monetary union has nothing to do with it. Um, I think the existence of the euro, the creation of monetary union, created an environment um, that made certain developments possible that otherwise probably would have led to a crisis earlier. Um, when you look at fiscal developments, and then there were some specific situations like um, Greece um, cheating on its fiscal numbers um, for seven, eight years, and then all of a sudden the deficit was not 6%, but 15%. So that was a special factor. We, we reacted to that, and now Eurostat is, has much more power to check the numbers, something that member states were not willing to give to Eurostat. So that's a very special factor. But otherwise, um, monetary union um, um, led to a situation where, whether it's Greece or Ireland or Spain, 
um, at a moment when the world had the great moderation and a lot of liquidity was created. Um, financial flows went into real estate, for instance, in, in Spain and Ireland to an extent that without creating the euro probably would never have taken place. So in that sense, um, there was a special situation. Um, I've written about that when I analyze the, the Irish um, crisis. Um, but that does not mean that the, the concept of monetary union or the institutional setup per se is wrong. Um, it was a transition period. Um, and I wrote about it because we will have other transition periods when other countries join the Euro area and they should learn from that episode. Um, so there was too much um, financial integration at that point in time, um, too low interest rates, but that was not only the Euro area, it was also the global phenomenon. It was also the, um, a phase where um, rating agencies failed with the AAA ratings that takes us to the subprime mortgage crisis here, but they also failed in other areas, not recognizing problems early enough. Um, technological progress played a role in, in my view because um, the rapid development of IT and computers um, allowed to develop instruments that um, 20 years earlier would not have existed. Um, and so these huge flows of finance across border, um, the excess liquidity created by, by central banks, the new instruments which only became possible um, in that decade because of the um, strong power of computers, all that came together. Um, and countries that joined the euro area could hide emerging problems for longer. And that's why it became very bad after 10 years. After first there was a global financial crisis because the global financial crisis was first. Europe was also hit, like other countries. And while we were just recovering, um, all these other problems that had accumulated for 10 years became very visible. Um, and that we had the second crisis um, within a short period of time. And that's why it became very bad. So it's a long story. As I said, I would need uh, much more time to go into the details. But um, I'm always admitting that the existence of the Euro area um, contributed to the crisis, um, but it was mainly a transition problem. It was mainly a transition problem, and I think we have addressed many of those issues now, so that these kind of problems are unlikely to to reappear. Doesn't mean that we cannot have other problems. Um, and there are legacy issues, as Jerome um, pointed out. Thank you. Um, very concise. Let me uh, ask Jessica is going to have to work double time moving the mic back and forth. Or those of you who can move to the standing mic at the back, please do that. Instead of raising your hand, those of you who are able-bodied, head to that mic. Um, and you will get preferential treatment. Um, please state your name affiliation and then um, and whether you're asking a question obviously to Klaus or additionally to Jeremy, please. Uh, Catherine Mann, Chief Economist at the OECD um, and I'm taking the opportunity of being a former Peterson Senior Fellow to, uh, to uh, take the floor. Um, so I want to take a slightly different tack on the question that Adam asked and, and that is uh, you emphasized the collective action that uh, the governments took in 2009, and that was very beneficial in terms of fiscal response. So I would rather emphasize the collective action that they took in 2011, which was actually extremely damaging to the European economy. And not all the countries needed to take the fiscal actions that they did do. Uh, so the related point is the asymmetry uh, which Jeremy brought up in the uh, in the stability and growth pact. So, going forward, what avenue is there to create a more symmetric approach to the stability and growth pact, or whatever is going to follow on from that, to ensure that that there is uh, that that when actions need to be taken by certain parties in fact, do get taken. There has to be a asymmetry in, in, in reaction. The second question that I have, and I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm uh, taking the floor uh, on the basis of my, my former role here, 
Uh, the second question is, you have emphasized the importance of market discipline in driving uh, going forward, that market discipline should play an incredibly important role. And yet you just described a world where the market really screwed up in terms of uh, first thinking all of these economies were going to be uh, identical in terms of the value of their sovereign uh, obligations, and you suggested that somehow financial integration was precipitated to an even greater extent by computer and so forth and so on. So if I take that um, argument going forward, and I'm t looking at something like fintech and a lot of other countries where there's a lot of financial flows, even if they are not part of the monetary union, why do you emphasize the importance of market discipline when we know that markets are irrational? And that's going to be a problem going forward. I think I answered immediately. Otherwise, yeah. before gets the question. Sorry, I was oh. staring there because I'm waiting for the answer. Um, of course, we're all um, wondering what Nicholas will ask next. But um, <laughs> on your second point first, where did I emphasize market discipline so much this evening? I'm not aware. You don't find that in my speech. I, I did, but I can, I can give the answer if you want. <laughs> good. And that's good if you can also help me. Because, um, of course, to the extent possible to use um, market discipline um, can be helpful. But I have said over and over again in the last few years that we have seen huge market failure. We saw it in the run-up to the crisis in, until 2009. And we saw it when markets, um, there was another overshooting in the opposite direction um, during the crisis. So we have seen tremendous market failures. That's why it's not sufficient to rely only on market discipline. It just doesn't work in my view. Um, and that's, of course, an important reason why we need some rules. Because if market discipline could solve everything, then we don't need um, the rules to make monetary union work. That's one reason why we have a stability and growth pact. Um, I wasn't quite clear what you mean by a symmetric approach. You mean countries that have excessive deficit and countries that have um, maybe excessive surpluses? Okay, um, that's right. There's no symmetry there to forcing countries. You also made that, that point. You cannot force a surplus country. That's the same experience the IMF has made dealing with um, um, asymmetries. We know it goes back to Keynes and and... White, they argued about that already, and Keynes lost. Um, and um, politically, it seems he was right that um, countries in a strong position, um, it's much harder to force them than countries in a weak position. So we also have not solved that problem in Europe. I don't, I, sorry, Klaus, I can't quite let you leave it there. Um, the very premise of the, many of the things you worked on, like the Stability and Growth Pact and the various Maastricht treaties, are that it's a rules-based system and that countries as members of Europe are equal members of Europe. And so to say that the European Union or the Eurogroup has to fail in the same way that the IMF failed, it seems to me is not correct. The, East, the European Union has the right to impose rules on its surplus members by a majority vote of its members. The fact that some are richer than others should not be a consideration in the way it is in the IMF where you have large voting shares. No, you're right not to let me get away too easily yeah, um, on this one. Um, but then looking at the fiscal situation, um, Germany basically is in its normal um, situation where it should be according to the Stability and Growth Pact. It has a balanced budget. Well, it had a small surplus, but it also um, basically has eliminated its, its um, output gap. So the normal situation for Germany would be a balanced budget. Um, the problem is that some others don't have that. Um, in that sense, we are in a transition period. Um, I think, and this is a tr traditional disagreement between um, North America, the Anglo-Saxon world, and the continental Europe, um, or at least Germany and some of its neighbors believe much less in demand stimulus. That's an issue that I have experienced the last 40 years while I work as an economist. Um, and this still is a controversy. Um, I think during times like now, where we have above potential growth rate in Europe, there's no reason to have fiscal stimulus, um, as some people still believe. 
Um, I, I don't share that view, which I read often in the Financial Times. Um, but it's a traditional disagreement that um, is long standing um, and is often very fiercely um, argued about on both sides. What I find um, really amazing is that looking back over these last 40 years, despite this continuous disagreement, that on a per capita basis, growth has always been the same um, on both sides of the Atlantic, despite these very different philosophical approaches to the conduct of economic policies. Jerome wanted to add something? Yeah. Uh, this, this still works, I think. So very very brief, briefly. So on, on the first set of issues, I, I think, Kathy, you were sort of conflating two issues. One, symmetric versus asymmetric rules, and the other is to, how to avoid procyclicality. So, so, so I think that on, on symmetry, I agree with, with Klaus and, and, and with Adam. So, you know, you, you can reasonably ask Germany to do things to reduce its current account surpluses of a structural kind, but to ask Germany to sort of incur debt on its own account when it doesn't really need it for its own cyclical purposes, just to pull the rest of the Eurozone out of a recession is asking too much. And that is the reason why I believe we would need a Euro area fiscal capacity for those moments, right? Um, otherwise, I also think we can fix the rules to make them less procyclical. On market discipline, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in market discipline, and, and I also agree with you that markets often fail. And, and so the, the, the way of reconciling these two things is markets are only as good as the legal frameworks and institutions that support markets. And this is true not just in financial markets, but also in, in real markets. I mean, to have you know, functioning price signals, you need a functioning competition regime. And so to have functioning price signals for sovereigns, meaning, meaning yields going up, you need a, a credible, uh, I think, bail-in regime uh, that, that is transparent and predictable. And I think, in principle, it can be designed. So I completely agree with Klaus on that. It's just extremely hard to design it and get there if your debt is already high. That's, that's the tough problem. Uh, Mr. Uh, Managing Director, thank you very much for your... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm Nicolas Veron uh, here at the Institute, also at Bruegel in Brussels, so I wanted to thank you for a very constructive and forward-looking speech, and I'll pick up on the previous uh, point that Jeremy just said on the infrastructure for market discipline, and uh, some of it is reliable numbers. So you alluded to the Greek situation, the fact that the Greek government wasn't fully forthcoming with the right numbers uh, at different points in the 2000s, uh, and the fact that uh, Eurostat now has stronger powers and intervention tools, but procedures are one thing and incentives are a different one. And statisticians around Europe and also in the rest of the world are looking at the case of Mr. Andreas Georgiou, the former head of the Greek statistical office between 2000 and two, uh, 2010 and 2015, uh, who is a defendant in multiple lawsuits who have been widely uh, viewed and described as political and that in a way is more real than uh, procedures at Eurostat. So I would like to have your views on what you think of this case, uh, what you think it means for Greece, for the Greek economy, the relationship between Greece and the Eurozone, but also more broadly for the Eurozone policy framework. Thank you. I don't think it has an impact on the European policy framework, but um, I don't like what I see happening in Greece. Um, and it has been discussed several times um, in the Eurogroup. And um, all the governments have expressed very clear the expectation that the Greek government, to the extent possible, makes sure that this is a fair case. They have also, um, the, as you know, the Greek finance minister um, um, created a law that they will pick up the legal cost um, of the defendants. And I think that's the minimum. But then there are also limits because one cannot decide in the Eurogroup um, um, to interfere in the Greek um, judicial system. You can have your views how it works or doesn't work, um, but there are limits of how much one can, as an institution or the European Commission or other member states, interfere here directly. But um, it has been made clear to the Greek side that this um, damages their reputation um, um, in general and in markets in particular.
Thank you. I'll follow up with a great question as well. I'm Katarina Soku with uh, um, uh, Greek Daily Kathimarini and a visiting fellow here at the Elliot School. So my, my question would be, given the context, the backdrop of uncertainty in the financial markets, can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, uncertainty in the financial markets and concern about uh, complacency. Uh, the Greek, uh, uh, the Greek uh, government is trying to uh, exit to the markets, this, test the markets this year. So hoping for a clean exit, like by the end of this program. Are you confident that the current uh, debt management strategy can get them there? And uh, if, uh, if that fails, uh, are you ready to provide yet another support for program for Greece in the backdrop again of, uh, as you explained, the IMF withdrawing from Europe and maybe not wanting to pick up the cost next time? Thank you. So the, as you know, the current third Greek program started two years ago in August 2015. It has an envelope of up to 86 billion euro. So far, we have only dispersed 39 billion euros, so there's a lot of money left in the program. It runs till another 10 months, till August um, next year. Um, I think it was positive that Greece was able to issue a bond um, for the first time in three years in July, quite successfully. Um, that was an important first step, no more than a first step. But it was good to start early, because it would not work if a country till the end of the program is fully financed by the ESM or the IMF, and then from the next day fully by the market. So it has to be a gradual process. But the um, debt management strategy is one thing, and it's important. But the key aspect, of course, is whether the program credibly continues. And um, I think there are good signs for that. Cooperation has been good the last few year, two years. Um, not um, during the first half of 2015. Um, but um, there's still something to be done. Um, there's a reason why this program runs another 10 months. Um, it's good that we are out, or Greece is out of this very difficult phase, that there have to be cuts in services, increases in taxes and all that to, um, to reduce the fiscal deficit. Now it's more a question of implementation, what was already um, decided, and importantly, take measures to stimulate um, potential growth. So we are now in that phase, and um, if that succeeds, um, I think Greece will be able to go back to the markets again and again, and then refinance itself on a, on a regular basis from, from um, August, September next year. But it will mainly depend on their policies and on the determination to complete the reform program. Um, the debt management office of Greece is actually quite, quite professional and, and very capable of then doing. And um, there's a very good chance that they can do it, yes. Great. Uh, this will be the last question, please. Yeah, Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. Very quickly on this issue of the asymmetric uh, fiscal shock capacity that you described. Um, in the event that such a capacity were to be established, was hosted uh, with the ESM under whatever name it might have at that time, would you envision that that capacity would be of such a magnitude that the ESM or whatever institution it would be would require additional resources? Or could you, in your envisioning of this capacity and the types of scales of asymmetric shocks that you envision it, uh, addressing be managed within the existing fiscal resources at the ESM? Yeah. It's hard to say because we are several steps before such a decision. And let me say again, it's not my main intention to get more facilities into the ESM, so I care less who manages it. I always think first what is really needed for the Euro area. Um, that's how I have spent my last 25 years, and I will continue to do that. And I think that such a facility indeed would be good. Um, when um, I look at the US model, the rainy day funds that the US states have, most of them, or this arrangement about the complementary unemployment um, benefit scheme, um, that if we try to duplicate something like that, then we don't really need additional resources. There would probably be a transition period where maybe a backstop would be required. Um, 
but compared to other ESM lending that we have so far, which is very long term, 20, 30 years, this kind of backstop, like the backstop for the SRF, would have relative short maturity. So the money would flow back relatively quickly and and um, could be used again. So um, in that sense, I don't think that would be the most urgent need to increase the capacity of the ESM. We have um, almost 400 billion euro in unused lending capacity at the moment um, um, that is available for our different tools. Um, of course, there's also the question behind your your question, um, how big would such a um, facility to deal with astromatic shocks or a facility for macroeconomic stabilization would have to be? And I have mentioned on another occasion that it should be somewhere between 1% and 2% of euro area GDP, which is around 100 to 200 billion euro, which would still be much below our remaining lending capacity. But if, again, if we use some of the US models, then money would come in also from other sources. So it would not um, predominantly have to come from ESM resources. Thank you very much. Uh, my microphone seems to have been restored from the crisis. Um, let me just close by thanking my colleague, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, who, of course, grapples with these issues daily, but especially Klaus Regling, who has been a true European and a true public servant for decades, uh, has founded and successfully managed a new institution that is contributing to the stability of Europe and thus of the world. And while we didn't have the budget for champagne today, let me at least 